Good to have you here again, Village Bible Church. We are beginning a brand new sermon series. We just got done with the book of Philemon. In the fall, we're going to be going through the book of 1 Corinthians. And today, we begin a series looking at several women in the Bible. Last summer, we looked at some of Jesus' closest followers, the men who were his disciples. And this summer, we're going to look at several women who were instrumental to God's plans in the Bible. We begin this morning by talking about a time that was really challenging in ancient Israel. It was very similar to something that we experienced here in America about four years ago now. I'm sure you all remember it. There was a man in Minneapolis, had an interaction with police. George Floyd was his name. He died. And in the immediate aftermath of his death, there were protests, not only here in America, but all around the world. Many of these protests were verbal, with people making their feelings known, letting people know how angry they were. But in many of these protests, things got out of control. There was vandalism. There was violence. There was looting of stores that were broken into. As we watch these things on the nightly news and listen to these stories on the radio and, and saw what was going on online, especially on social media, it seemed as though it was a time of lawlessness. Regardless of how you felt about the issue, as you saw all of this happening, it seemed as though everyone was doing whatever they wanted. It seemed like no one was in control. No one was able to put a stop to it. And for many, if not everyone, this was a time of anxiety. This was a time of fear. Is there ever going to be someone who can control this situation and make it stop? Is it ever going to stop? How bad is it going to get? In ancient Israel, it was very similar. This is known as the time of the judges, a time when Scripture tells us everyone did whatever seemed right to him. Everyone did whatever he or she thought was appropriate. It was a time of lawlessness, of fear, of anxiety. If someone wanted something, they stole it. If someone didn't like someone else, they could be violent. They did all of this without any fear that anyone was going to stop them. It was a time of rampant immorality. Any pleasure that someone wanted to indulge in, they took advantage of it. Everyone did whatever he or she wanted. The time of the judges, a time of lawlessness, a time of fear, a time of insecurity. And it is during this time that we see the story of two widows. Widows in the time of the judges would have been especially vulnerable. No one to protect them. No one to provide for them. In their ancient culture, women were dependent on their husbands to be able to provide for them. They would have been looking at the world around them in extreme fear, wondering, who is going to take care of me? Who is going to protect me? And in these two widows, in their story, we are going to see a God who is at work in amazing Ways, the same God who is still at work in our day today. We're going to see women who show kindness and a God who is still showing kindness. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Ruth. We are in the book of Ruth today. Uh, I sure wish that we had several weeks to go through the book of Ruth because there's so much here, so much good stuff. We could spend two months in the book of Ruth and not get through it all. But today we're going to see the woman named Ruth. We're going to see her mother-in-law, Naomi. And we're going to see how God works in their lives to show them kindness, to care for them in their neediness, in their insecurity. And we're going to see that this same God is still doing the same thing in our day. 
Now I mentioned, if you have Ruth open, you can see right there at the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, during the time of the judges. Okay, when we, in our modern day, read through that, you know, we just sort of skim right by that, right? We don't even pay any attention to it. But as I've already said, to the ancient audience, that would have alerted them, this is a dangerous time. This is a scary time. This is an every man or every woman for him or herself kind of time. And it is in this day, in the land of Israel, where there is a famine. People don't have enough food. And because it's the time of the judges, and everyone is doing whatever he or she wants, there is fighting over food. There's no security over food. There's no way that you know that you're going to be able to, to continue having your food. The little bit of scraps that there are, it is a scary and uncertain time. And we read in the book of Ruth about a man named Elimelech who has a wife named Naomi and two sons. And in the midst of the famine in the land of Israel, Elimelech probably unwisely chooses to leave the land where his people are, to leave the land of God's people to go to another land, a foreign land, a land called Moab, a land where they do not honor the God of Israel, they do not worship the God of Israel, they worship any number of foreign false gods. But in his search for food, he packs up his wife, he packs up his two sons, and he heads for the land of Moab. Now, you can see maybe on this uh, map what we're talking about here. He begins in the city of Bethlehem, which is in the upper left of this map. He can't just cross over the Dead Sea in order to get to the land of Moab. So they have to set out on foot all the way around the Dead Sea, through Jerusalem, around Jericho, all the way down into Moab. This would have taken many days. There would have been many potentially scary possibilities of what could happen on their journey. But eventually, they arrive in the land of Moab. Now, what they're hoping for is they can put down some roots, they can have the food that they need, they can begin providing for themselves, that they can do a sort of restart in this new land. They leave their people, they go to a pagan people, a people who are not God worshipers, and it's all because they're hoping that they have enough food. But tragedy strikes early on. It doesn't take long. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, dies. Leaves her alone with the two young men. They're in the land for about 10 years or so. And yes, there's no famine. I mean, they have what they need as far as material possessions go, absolutely. But there's no security. It's still the time of the judges. And after about 10 years... Naomi's sons have taken wives and, and are now establishing themselves in the community. But both of Naomi's sons die. Okay, so understand how this has gone for poor Naomi. Her husband packs her and the two boys up, takes them to a land they've never been to, a, a land where they don't know anyone and in a span of about 10 years, okay, they have the food that they need, absolutely. But in a span of about 10 years, she loses her husband. She loses her son. She loses her other son. She is now left practically all alone. The only two people in her life are her two daughters-in-law. These young women who came from the land of Moab, that was their home. They married these boys, and now all three of them are widows. All three of them are practically left alone. What are they going to do? Naomi decides to set out for her homeland again. Naomi says, I'm going back to Bethlehem. Naomi says, I am, I am on my way back to my people. And these two daughters-in-law, one named Orpah, one named Ruth, say, we're going with you. We're not going to let you go alone. We're going to stay together. The three of us, we're a team now. And they all set out on the journey. Had to be a scary journey. As I showed you on the map, imagine three women on their own having to go now back from Moab all the way back to Jerusalem all by themselves. 
in the time of the judges, the time of lawlessness. But they begin on their journey, and not long into their trip, Naomi turns to the two daughters-in-law and says, Ladies, stop. You don't have husbands. I can't give you a husband. When you get to Bethlehem, there's no guarantee that I'm going to be able to get you a husband. You need someone in this culture, in this day. You need someone to provide for you. You need someone to provide security for you. Go back to your homeland. At least you have family there. At least you have neighbors there that you know. Go back to Moab. Don't follow me any longer. Then after some back and forth, the, the, the ladies say, we're not going to go. No, you need to go. No, we're not going to go. Eventually, one of them, the daughter-in-law Orpah, does go back to her family. She does go back to her community. But Ruth is insistent. Ruth is not going to let Naomi, her mother-in-law, travel on her own. Ruth is not going to let Naomi navigate this journey without her there as a support, as a help. Ruth is staying true to the fact that we are now a team. Now, it may not be the three of us anymore, but now it's the two of us. And there's more back and forth. Uh, you need to go home. No, I'm not going to. Back and forth and back and forth. And in the midst of her insistence, where Ruth is not going back home, she's following Naomi. In the midst of this, she makes a pretty unbelievable decision, showing how serious she is about taking care of this woman, Naomi, about helping her in this journey and when she gets back to Bethlehem. Uh, pretty striking. Uh, remember, Ruth is from the land of Moab. Ruth had been worshiping all sorts of other gods, but in the midst of this challenging time, she says, I'm going to give up all of those gods, and I am going to worship the God of Israel. In order to stay with Naomi, in order to continue with Naomi, and in, in order to be a support for Naomi in this journey and after this journey, uh, Ruth surrenders her gods for the one true God. Ruth gives up all of the gods that she's been worshiping since she, as far back as she could remember. And she says to Naomi, your God will be my God. I'm not going anywhere, Naomi. I'm going to leave the past behind and I'm going to worship the God of Israel. Uh, look at this uh, in chapter 1. We see this. Look at verse 15 in chapter 1 in the book of Ruth. Naomi says to Ruth, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Right? She's gone back to the neighborhood. She's gone back to her old way of life. Uh, she's staying there, worshiping the way that she has always worshipped. And Naomi's telling Ruth, why don't you do the same thing? Follow her. But Ruth says, don't plead with me to abandon you or to return and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. And... Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. That's where I'm going to be buried. May the Lord punish me and do so severely if anything but death separates you and me. And when Naomi sees that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped talking to her. And, and this isn't, she stops and, you know, it's like pouting, you know. I'm not talking to you anymore. The argument the challenge, the, the go back to your home stops. Naomi gives in. All right, Ruth, I guess you're coming with me. Ruth was so determined to show kindness to Naomi, to support Naomi, that she is willing to abandon all of those false gods and follow the one true God. Now, when we read an ancient story like this from thousands of years ago, it's uh, really easy for most of us to struggle to imagine what this scenario was like. I mean, some of us come from traditions in which false gods are worshipped, in, in which there are idols in living rooms, and, and these things are, are worshipped openly. Some of us come from those traditions, and so we can understand what true false gods are like. But for most of us, this seems very foreign. And so we can dismiss this. Oh, well, I would never do that. I don't know. 
looks like. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, something that's carved out of wood or stone or forged in metal, bowing down to it, worshiping it. It just doesn't make any sense. I would never do that. And so we can move very quickly through a situation like this in Ruth. Oh, okay, false gods, her gods, their gods. Okay, fine, no big deal. We can move through it. But if we stop long enough, if we're willing to do this, we can see that every single one of us, like those people in Moab, every single one of us has false gods that we worship. Every one of us. These are gods that we turn to for security. Gods that we turn to for validity. Gods that we turn to for comfort. Unless we turn to the one true God for our security and our validity and our comfort, we are turning to a false God for those things. Now we can do this in so many ways, countless ways. We could spend all afternoon talking about them and not even get close. We do this with finances. That's where my security is. Do I have enough money? Do I have enough saved in the IRA? Am I going to be secure in my retirement years? Am I going to have everything that I need? It's not bad to save. It's not bad to plan. Those things are wise. But when our sense of security is in our finances and not in the God who provides the finances, that's when we're turning the cash into our God and not worshiping the one true God. Those of you who are students, it can be grades, it can be achievement in your activities, your sports and your music. It can be getting into the right college. It can be getting the right job after college or getting into the good trade school that will help you to do the trade that will allow you to make the money that you want. All of those things can become gods and you know it and you feel it because day in and day out you wake up and you go to sleep thinking about it. There's the pressure, there's the burden, and it's because these things are God's. I am not going to be somebody unless I get those things, the, the grades, the, the education, the job. And you feel the pressure, and the pressure is there because you get a sense that somehow your identity is involved in those things and not in the true God happens in relationships all the time relationships become God so easily and that's where the security and the validity and the comfort I mean you can be all wrapped in do I have a girlfriend or boyfriend do I have a husband or a wife uh, how much do they love me how much do they like me how much do they lavish praise on me how much attention do they pay to me again none of these things is bad hear me on this None of these things is bad. It's good to have finances. It's good to get a good education. It's good to get a good job. Having a relationship, if that's what God leads you to, is good. But these things are not ultimately, should not ultimately, be the source of our security, our validity, or our comfort. All right? For me, I mean, I have many. I could talk to you all day long about the false gods that I have to shout down all the time. So much so that if I spent enough time talking to you, you would say, why in the world do they let that dude up there preaching? <laughs> what are they doing with this guy? Uh, one, one of mine, again, I got dozens and dozens, but I want to show you how simple this can be. One of mine is the God of ice cream. You're going, ice cream can't be a God, Cisco. What are you talking about? No, it has to be something more serious has to be something more weighty, right? I talked about security validity, but I also talked about comfort. At the end of the bad day, when there are questions that aren't being answered, when there are problems that don't seem like there are solutions to, do I always, on a dime, pivot to talking with the Lord, meditating on His Word, asking Him for guidance and patience and peace. Is that what I do in order to be comforted in Almighty God? Is that what I do? Or chocolate rocky road. 
And sometimes it's strawberry, sometimes it's pistachio. I'm really not picky. Where do we go for our comfort? You see, again, they can be weighty things. Uh, it can be the God of addiction, the God of drugs, the God of booze, the God of sex. It can be all those things. It can be the God of finances. It can be the God of material prosperity, bigger and bigger and bigger houses. It can be the God of grades and jobs. It can be the God of relationships. It can be the God of food. All of these things are false gods. None of these things is inherently bad. But when it takes the place of God, that's when we have to ask ourselves, are we willing, like Ruth, to surrender these false gods in order to worship the one true God? Are we willing to do it? Are we willing to lay it down? Are we willing to put it in its proper place? Are we willing to lean into God for our security. Ultimately, he's the one who has promised to take care of you. He's promised it. Are we going to lean into him for our validity? You only have value because you are a daughter or son of the living God. Your identity is in Christ. That is who you are. If you are a follower of Jesus, your identity is wrapped up in Him as someone made by Him, forgiven by Him, dearly loved by Him. And that is the only reason you have any value at all. It's not because of the people or the things around you. And yet we look to them so often for that, that validity. I, I've accomplished something. I, I am somebody even if all of that other stuff falls apart, you are somebody because God says you are somebody. And so we don't need to chase after the false gods, the God of comfort. You know, sometimes the finances are about security, but it's also about comfort. I, I don't want to have to struggle. I, I don't, I don't want to have to give anything up. I don't want to have to in any way engage in risks. There's so many ways that we find comfort. All of these things are false gods. We cannot look to the story of Ruth and say, you know, I wouldn't get wrapped up in something like that because every single one of us is wrapped up in it. Will we ask God to give us the determination like Ruth to surrender those false gods and to move forward worshiping the one true God? He is ultimately the only one we need for our security, our validity, our comfort, are everything. Ruth is determined. Uh, Naomi, I'm laying down my gods. I'm worshiping your God. And then they continue on their journey. Now they're going the other direction, moving from Moab all the way through these other areas into the land of Bethlehem, where they are going to come back into Naomi's old neighborhood. They're going to see Naomi's old crowd. There's no family members there, at least not that they can immediately think of, but it's at least a community where they are known. And so they come back home, they get into the neighborhood, people greet them, Naomi tells them about everything that's happened, all the boys have died, I'm just left with this one daughter-in-law. It is tragedy, unspeakable tragedy. Naomi feels as though she has nothing left but to come back home and essentially beg there is a tradition in ancient Israel during the harvest time where all the grain is being harvested but God wanted to provide a safety net for poor people he wanted them to get some scraps at least to be able to be cared for and so he told the landowners when you are doing your harvest don't grab everything don't, don't, don't take it all for yourself. Leave some of what's around the edges. Leave what falls down on the ground. And let the people who are needy come and glean. Come and grab that stuff. That, that essentially seems like leftovers. Don't take it all. Let these people have something. And so Ruth, supporting Naomi, when they get back to Bethlehem, sets out. It's harvest time. I'm going to go out. I'm going to grab some of the grain. I'm going to, to do the equivalent of, of, of begging for scraps, except there's no begging necessary. This is all part of the system. She's going to go out. 
She's going to try to find a place to be able to grab some grain so that she and Naomi can be cared for. But what, and again, you can miss this, I think, if we're just reading through the text too quickly. One of the things that we see that is always striking to me is the fact that God is going to show kindness to Ruth even when she doesn't know it, okay? And he does the same thing for us. We're not paying attention. We're not looking at what's going on around us. We don't see God's kindness every single moment of every single day, and yet it's there. And we will see this as, as Ruth and Naomi come back into Bethlehem. Ruth makes a decision to go out into the fields to be able to glean, to be able to get some of that grain. It's still the time of the judges. It's still dangerous. There's still security issues. She is a vulnerable young widow. And yet God shows his kindness for her in keeping her safe and leading her to a certain field. Uh, look at chapter 2. In chapter 2, it says, Ruth left and entered the field to gather grain, uh, gather grain behind the harvester. She just basically goes out in the community, finds a field, and starts gathering grain. But then it says, She happened to be in the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who is from Elimelech's family. Now, we'll find more about Boaz here in just a couple of moments, but what I want you to focus on for just a moment is uh, understand Boaz is a good man, he's a godly man, he's an honorable man, he's going to make sure that Ruth and Naomi get taken care of. Well, more on that in a moment, but what we see here that we could miss over if we're just reading it quickly is this phrase that always makes me laugh. I chuckle when I see this. She happened to be in the portion of the field belonging to Boaz. Now, if you blow through that too quickly, it sounds like, you know, she's got 10 choices, and hey, hey wouldn't you know, she just randomly chose Boaz's field. I mean, isn't that lucky? She sort of rolled the dice, and, and she figured this out. Man, this is just amazing to her. As though God's not in it. As though God is not leading her. As though God doesn't care about her. There is nothing that goes on in our lives. Nothing that is just so happened to be. There's no moment of your day where God is not sovereign and in charge and leading and engaged in your life. Now, that's challenging when the rough times come and we don't understand them and we wish they wouldn't happen. But even those God is using, God is guiding God knows where he wants you. He knows what he wants you to do. He knows what is necessary for you to be transformed as he's engaged in this lifelong process of transforming you to be more like Jesus. And God is going to get this done even when we don't know it. In that moment, there's no way that Ruth goes, oh, it's, it's Boaz's field. Oh, God is providing for me. Oh, God is taking care of me. There's no way. She goes out, very vulnerable, in a dangerous community, looks around and goes, well, I, I, I guess I'll pick this field. And just starts gathering some of the grain. Uh, this man, Boaz, is, uh, is really amazing. This man, Boaz, is widely respected in the community. Uh, he is wealthy. Uh, he's a man that people look up to and respect. It is his field that she is harvesting from. Uh, Ruth is, as I've mentioned, vulnerable and needy, just like Naomi. If someone doesn't provide for them, they're all left all alone. They're basically to starve to death. And yet Boaz, the man of honor, the godly man, sees that Ruth is in his field, asks a couple of questions. Who, who is this lady? What, where, where did she come from? Oh, 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 that's Naomi's daughter-in-law. He's heard about her. And he allows her to continue taking this grain from her field. Uh, not only that, he tells all of the guys who are in the field, you leave her alone. Don't cause her any problems. Don't say anything to her. You let her stay in this field. You make sure that she is protected in this field. 
And as we see God uh, sort of, uh, you know, randomly by chance, you know, Ruth just happened to go into this field. Of course, we know that God was guiding the whole thing, uh, showing that God shows kindness to the needy. And by the way, we're all needy. More on that in just a moment. God shows his kindness to the needy. Ruth and Naomi have no other way of eating. God just happens to lead Ruth into this field where the man Boaz, such a good man, would tell everyone. I imagine he sort of lays down the law. Uh, All right, guys, this young woman is here. She's in the field. She's, She's picking up grain. Don't you touch her. Don't you mess with her. Don't you harass her. Don't you say anything to her. You let her take whatever she can get. In the time of the judges, in the time of lawlessness, unless Boaz lays down the law like this, who knows what horrors could have been committed against Ruth. But God, working through Boaz, protects her. The needy one, he takes care of her. He's there every step of the way. Then the men leave Ruth alone, and Ruth gathers a bunch of grain and takes takes so much home, Naomi can't even believe it, right? But it's all because Boaz saw what was going on, and God, through Boaz, took care of this needy woman. Now, I say every single one of us is needy, even though we don't necessarily feel needy. There are times in our life when it comes to our material possessions where we absolutely feel needy, where we are, I mean, we we feel we're truly in need. You know, growing up, uh, we were extremely poor on welfare. Uh, They used to have this thing called government cheese that they would give you. It's kind of like getting a big thing of Velveeta, except Velveeta tastes good. I know some of you are like, Velveeta is a processed product. It's not, it's not good, but it tastes good. Whatever they put in it, it tastes good. Uh, this government cheese did not taste good, but uh, we were grateful for it. We, we, we had it. I mean, God took care of us when we were needy. But if you move out of that spot, if you move out of that level of need, if you get to the point where you can pay your bills, even if you're not wealthy, if you get to the point where you can pay your bills and, and you're not going to bed at night wrestling with that, you can start to say to yourself, oh, I'm, I remember when I was needy, but now I'm not needy. And the fact is, everything in the world, everything in the universe belongs to God. It's all His He gives you as much as he deems fit at any moment. Things can change any second. There's nothing in your bank account, nothing in your IRA or 401k, nothing in your closet, nothing in your refrigerator or pantry that God hasn't put there. None of this is done on your own. None of this is because only if I was a hard worker, I'm, I'm smart, I know how to plan. All of that is great, but it is God and God alone who is bringing these things to you. We are all needy, just like Ruth and Naomi. We may not realize it. We may not feel it. But our posture before God should be thank you, a posture of gratitude that says everything I have comes from you. Everything I have is a gift from you. Thank you. No matter what it is, no matter how much you have, it doesn't matter. It all comes from the Lord. We are all needy, just like Ruth, just like Naomi. Now, fast forward in the story here. Uh, Naomi, uh, Ruth uh, meets Boaz. Ruth gets lots of grain from Boaz. Ruth takes it back home to Naomi. Naomi can't believe how much grain she has. Uh, what field were you in? Naomi starts throwing questions at Ruth. Where, where did you get this grain? Where did you glean this grain? What happened? Oh, it was a field of, uh, of some guy named Boaz. Now, this was big news. This was great news. Because Boaz was something called a kinsman redeemer. Kinsman redeemer. Let me explain this. In the ancient world, I'm just going to say this may seem a little weird to us, but in the ancient world... If a woman 
was childless and her husband died, then it was up to another male in the family line to marry her, to have children, and, and those children, at least the first one, uh, would essentially be the children of the dead man. Okay, Family line mattered. The fact that you had uh, someone to carry on your line, the fact that you had someone to hand your material possessions down to, the, the fact that you had someone who could carry your name into the future, this mattered significantly in this world. And so there was a, a responsibility that men had in society if a woman had a husband who died without any children to marry her and have a child with her and carry on this man's name, carry on his family line. Now, now right now, some of you are thinking about your family and saying, praise God, that's not the way we do it. <laughs> right? I'm just so glad that that has changed. All right, I'll say amen to that. That's fine. <laughs> but that's how, that's how it went down. It was one of the ways that God provided for people to make sure that they were taken care of. There's a little tension in the story uh, because uh, Ruth goes in and uh, does a little uh, sort of courtship ceremony with Boaz. It's pretty amazing, again, especially in our day. Uh, Boaz is, is harvesting the grain along with his men. They go to what's called the threshing floor where they get all the good parts of the grain separated out. And, and they, they hang out and they work all day and they're working really hard. And at night they have a feast and a party. And Boaz falls asleep right there at the threshing floor, right there where they handle all that grain. And R Ruth walks in. Boaz is asleep. Ruth walks in uncovers his ankles, you know, lifts up, he would have had a longer sort of flowing almost robe on, uh, lifts up this robe and lays her head by his feet and just lays there until he wakes up. And when he does, he knows immediately what Ruth is doing. She's essentially saying, will you marry me? Okay, now several of you are married. Isn't this how you all got engaged? <laughs> That's how, it, there was no getting down on one knee and it, it, it just went up and, you know, lifted a pant leg up and <laughs> laid there and, and he knew, oh, you've chosen me. I'm so honored, right? That's how it went. All right. We, we don't, that is not how it went for me. Uh, we, <laughs> we, we, we customs change. But that's the way that this went down, and Boaz immediately knew that Ruth was essentially, uh, you could say it this way, proposing to him. There was uh, this feeling of honor on the part of Boaz. He's an older man. Ruth is a younger man. Boaz knows that Ruth is already known around the community as a woman of noble character. She's a good woman. Boaz can't believe that Ruth has chosen him. I mean, you, you could have had some, some young, strong guy, and you could have been with him for decades, and, and instead you chose me. You showed me kindness in choosing me. And it seems like there's a love story that's written, and that's where it's going to end, right? But of course, there's tension. Because as it turns out, there's another man in the community who's a closer relative than Boaz, and that means he's the true kinsman redeemer. He's the one who's in line. He's the one who has to make a decision. Is he going to marry Ruth or not? And so Boaz has to say, essentially, I, I would love to marry you. I I'm honored that you would ask me, but there's this other guy, a guy who remains nameless in the book of Ruth. Poor fella. I don't even know who he is, right? Uh, he's a closer relative. He, he's the one who would have to marry you first. We have to at least give him the option. And so Boaz, th this almost seems uh, sneaky, but I don't mean sinister. I, I don't mean bad. Uh, he, he moves in and he, he tells this guy, hey, yeah, so uh, uh, this guy died. All of his land is still around. You know, he starts thinking about material possessions. Uh, you you want to take it? You want to be the redeemer? Oh, I'd love the land. That'd be great. That'd be sure. Yeah, I'll add that to my portfolio. Oh, he's also got a wife. 
And, and you'd have to have a child with her, and then a big chunk of what you have would end up being her child's. Oh, you know, on second thought, I don't know that I want to do this. Eh. And he backs away, and Ruth and Boaz are able to marry, and they have a child. They have a son. And it sounds like uh, if, if this was some sort of Hollywood movie where, where that's where it would end. Oh, and the baby's born and everybody celebrates and he's beautiful and it is wonderful how it's all come full circle, but there's more going on, much more going on. Beginning with the fact that God uses Ruth in the birth of this child, he uses Ruth to give Israel an earthly king. I want you to fast forward here to chapter 4. And look at verse 17 of chapter 4. Uh, in the book of uh, chapter 4, verse 17, in the book of 1 Samuel, which is the book that comes right after Ruth, we read about the fact that in this time of the judges, in this time of rebellion by the people of Israel, they look at all the nations around them and they see that all their nations have kings and they say to God, we want a king. In spite of the fact that God is their leader. Israel, in the midst of its sin, demands a king, and God is going to bring them a king named Saul, and, and we don't have time to get into it, but Saul is a terrible king. They should have known that God was the true king. God was the one they need. He is their true leader, but Israel demands a king. And what we see here at the end of the book of Ruth is God uses Ruth. All this started with her kindness with her surrender of her gods, with her care of Naomi. And God leads her to the field and leads her to Boaz and, and, and gets her past what's-his-name who wouldn't marry her and gets her into this marriage with Boaz where this son is born, the son named Obed. Verse 17, it says, They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. The text in verse 17 says, a son has been born to Naomi. They're, they're basically celebrating the fact that Naomi has this grandson. Her, her line is continuing as well. But it's obviously Ruth's baby. They named him, named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David, Israel's greatest king. David, a man who would make horrible mistakes, murder and adultery but a man who was loyal to God, uh, who repented of his sin, who followed the Lord until the very end and is still to this day known as Israel's greatest king. God blessed Ruth through her kindness, through her determination, through her surrender, leading her into the line of the king of Israel and the greatest king of all uh, of Israel, right? the greatest earthly king of all of Israel. As we see this, uh, it says again, look at the rest of the chapter here. These are the family records of Perez. Perez fathered Hezrin, who fathered Ram, who fathered Abinadab. We're going all the way through his line here. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse father, fathered David. Now, if the story ended there, it would be a beautiful ending, right? Ruth is needy. Ruth gets a husband. Ruth gets a a baby, a baby in the line of the king of David. This is extraordinary. Except the story doesn't end there. In fact, the story really doesn't end because not only does God use Ruth to get Israel an earthly king, but God uses Ruth to bring us an eternal king. They wouldn't have realized it in the moment when they're passing the baby around. Even ancient Israel wouldn't have totally grasped it as they were reading about all of these people who led all the way to King David. But we see in the very opening section of the book of Matthew in the New Testament that this genealogy that leads to King David doesn't stop at King David. It keeps on going. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 1. Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab, Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed followed Father Jesse. Jesse fathered King David. Then there's many more names in the genealogy in Matthew before we get to the very end. 
Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah, the Savior, the anointed one, the one that all of Israel had been waiting for, for generation upon generation, the only one we need, the only true king. Ruth, through her kindness, through her surrender, is blessed by God by being a part of the family line of Jesus. Now what we see here, sisters and brother, is brothers, is a God who is kind to the needy. A God who understands we are all needy. A God who has been working his plan out throughout all of human history. None of this is random. None of this just happens. Ruth doesn't just so happen into Boaz's field. God, the whole time, is working out his plan of salvation to bring us to him, to bring us to forgiveness, to bring us into his family. And so now, the God who took care of the needy in Ruth's day, who showed his kindness to the needy in Ruth's day, is still here, still showing his kindness to needy people like you and me. And because of what Ruth did and how God used her, because of this line that gets us all the way to Messiah Jesus, we can know that we are a part of God's family forevermore. Needy people being shown kindness by a God who loves us more than we can imagine.